it's going to be very difficult for you to find any actual research on Operation Core because technically speaking, it never officially became disclosed to the public, nor did it officially shut down either. And what I mean by that is that it's very possible that those within Operation Core are still working on it to this day or are working subsequently through another code name. But essentially, the core concept has never ended. Now, I know that I've done a handful of episodes, particularly in the last few weeks where I've talked about things like the Antarctic Treaty and different mysterious airlines that have been flying to and from different military bases as well as Antarctica, but I feel like to bring everything full circle, it's important that people understand what's going to be discussed here because Agartha is not particularly exclusive to the Antarctic, so to speak. So we first have to ask, what is Agartha? So for those of you who don't know, Agartha was supposedly and actually is still supposedly an underground or extremely advanced civilization that exists beneath the earth or in in the middle of it which kind of subscribes to there being a sort of hollow earth now i want to offer a bit of a different perspective on the hollow earth theory so for those of you who don't know the hollow earth theory very quickly is just a theory that the inner core of the earth is actually hollow And it is able to inhabit life forms and even many different types of life forms that may not be able to survive or exist for long periods of time on the surface of the earth. And so it kind of begs the question as to whether or not this is true. And Agartha is kind of like the Atlantis of this sort of proposal, if you will. With that being said, what I want to say is that Antarctica is not the only way that you can supposedly access or get into Agartha. It's one of the main ways, but it's also been said that the Bermuda Triangle is a way in which you can get there. It's also been said that there's certain access points within uh, Tibet in the Himalayas and things like that, but it's guarded by Buddhist monks, so to speak, which sound interesting because we'll get into that a little later about the marriage of, of church and state, so to speak. But one thing that really made me want to do this episode is the fact that even though there's not much proof of Agartha, the same names keep popping up over and over and over again throughout these different operations and throughout these different so-called rumors. Now, okay, when it comes to the rumors and the legend, so to speak, or the folklore of Agartha, you can say that it's completely false because it could be thousands of years of broken telephone, so to speak. Now, apparently... Anywhere from 2,500 to 3,000 years ago, humans or our ancestors, so to speak, on the surface of this planet were actually able to have access to this inner core of the earth or some type of inner city. Now, with that being said, I want to propose a theory that the earth as a whole may not be hollow, but there may be certain parts of it where it is sort of a seepage into large, vast, I guess you could say, caves if you want to call it or something that would be able to support life because of its connection to the surface of the earth and because of its connection to potential water sources in different areas of the planet now this is just a proposal i'm bringing up it doesn't it there's it's not factual by any means so i want to make that clear i don't want you guys to think that what you're thinking might be wrong and i'll be right it may actually be the reverse believe it or not but i think that It doesn't have to be one size fits all, if that makes sense. I think that if you're thinking about the hollow earth theory, it's very possible that the hollow earth theory could be viewed as it being hollow only in certain points or certain parts. And so, I mean, I would subscribe to that idea a little bit more simply because certain parts of the earth, at least so far scientifically, have been proven to be so rock solid that it's highly unlikely that there's life under those certain parts. And this is kind of where the deception comes in publicly because scientists will tell you there's nothing under there because believe me, we've checked and we've tried. But with that being said, what they didn't tell you is that they've only tested and released the results of one certain part of the planet. And so I think that when you approach a proposal in that type of way with a bit more of a moderate stance, then the reality that you may in fact be correct, I think increases tenfold in a lot of cases because you're not saying, okay, listen, either you believe that the earth is hollow or it's not. It's not so black and white. I think it's a little bit more than that. I think it has to do with certain parts of the earth either having 
very gaping large holes or caves, if you want to call them, that are big enough to sustain a city of sorts or some type of civilization, or certain parts may in fact be hollow and go right through from one end of the planet to the other. Now, the thing that's interesting, I mentioned when I started this episode that there's different names that occur, okay? And what, I'm, what I mean by that is that the different names that, are, that occur, excuse me, with having to do with the hollow earth theory, but more specifically Agartha, the city of Agartha, it's only the, it's the same handful of names. It's the same two, three different names, between Admiral Byrd and Edward Luhem and, and a few different gentlemen, it's the same group of guys. And it's ironic because if we look at someone, for example, like Admiral Byrd, back in the late, uh, mid to late 40s, excuse me, he ran an operation called Operation High Jump. Now, Operation High Jump was entirely organized by Admiral Byrd. And it was led by Rear Admiral Richard H. Cruzen. And what they essentially did was they sent, I believe, three or 4,000 soldiers between the years 1946 and 1947 to essentially train personnel in, I guess you could say, amplified weather conditions, amplifying existing stores of knowledge of electromagnetic, geological, geographic, hydrographic, and meteorological propagation conditions. I know that sounds a little bit advanced, but essentially what was going on there was different kinds of testing. And they gave a few different reasons, and this is according to Wikipedia, but Operation High Jump seemed to be like a very clean, transparent operation, if you want to call it. But I truly believe there's more to it than that, because Operation Core may have actually been the reality of what Operation High Jump was supposed to be. So... Why would you send three, 4,000 soldiers to Antarctica to train just for a year between 1946 and 47? Why? I'll tell you why. Because it's more than likely that when you send that amount of soldiers there, you're looking for something. You're not just training that many. I can understand to a certain degree that you want them to be there to, to train, but to say that this operation only lasted one year either means one of two things. It was it was an honest operation, and they didn't get the results they were looking for when they were training the soldiers, or they found what they needed, or they did the job that they had to do in which they were assigned to do secretly, and then they got it done and they left. Because you have to remember, three to four thousand trained soldiers is is not a small job. It's a it's a serious thing. It's no joke, particularly when you look at, for example, Afghanistan, with I believe there's still being seven or 8,000 soldiers there at this moment, uh, United States soldiers. That's a lot of soldiers. And so to say that, you, let's just say, let's round it up. Let's just say there's 8,000 soldiers in Afghanistan right now, okay? And Trump said he's going to get them out, but again, that's got nothing to do with it. But those are the same soldiers I'm talking about. H even half of that going to Antarctica, that's quite the number. Clearly, that shows you need manpower for something, and you need as many soldier-like mindsets as possible when you go there if you're sending that many soldiers there to train and the operation only lasted a year something is off about this which is why it's very difficult to actually find research and results about operation core because they don't want you thinking that they're still going back there and things are still happening there all right and believe me when i tell you that I would put my money on the fact that the government has investigated sites like the the Bermuda Triangle, like the secret supposed caves and things that lead into Agartha through the Himalayas or through different Buddhist temples or certain places in the mountains and Antarctica. Because again, we see UFOs flying there all the time, whether or not they're being manned and controlled by humans or military personnel or they're being controlled by something else. At the end of the day, there's the same reoccurring theme. They keep going between these three general locations. And there's a few other as well, but they all seem to have an abnormal usage or presence of electromagnetic frequencies. There's just an abnormal presence that has yet to, been to, to be explained publicly. And so you're telling me that the government hasn't inquired about these things? They want to know every single thing that they can control and sort of possess and take over. And so to say that they haven't looked into it it would be preposterous in a lot of ways. Now, I want to talk about a few different things here because there is supposedly a leaked 
I guess you could call map of sorts that the Nazis had when they were looking for Agartha. So there were a few reasons why the Nazis wanted to get to the center of the earth or to this underground civilization. The first reason was very simple. In case they had lost the war or something catastrophic happened to the entire planet, they wanted somewhere where they would be able to be safe and survive. Now, ultimately, you'd probably think nowadays the best route to go is to become an interplanetary species. You kind of want to go from planet to planet instead of trying to go deeper into the core of the one you're on right now. But that's the way they thought. And so I'm going to put the picture up right now, if I haven't already, of there being this Nazi map that supposedly shows and details what's inside Agartha. Now, ironically enough, if we take a look at this picture, what we're going to see here is we're going to see the Nazi eagle with the flag, uh, sorry, with the swastika. And we're going to see a couple drawings of Antarctica. And what we're also going to see is a handful of graphs. Again, it's all written in German. And it basically explains the different ways in which they try to get into Agartha because they were trying to find a place in which they could, which could be their ultimate, I guess you could say, plan Z back up if if any if everything went to shit now we don't know if they really went there and that's all open for interpretation and because i'm not really trying to talk about that i'm not going to delve too much into it but this piece of document this piece of paper this large paper is exactly what we need because this is what's going to help us support our proposal here so then shortly after the war again the war ended i believe in 1943 or 1944 if i'm not mistaken and just a couple years later, all of a sudden, Operation High Jump happens. So people are still getting used to coming out of the war. Everyone's going back to work. The economy's thriving. Everyone's starting to get a little bit better again. They're still troubled times because they're trying to recover. This is the perfect chance to, to send 4,000 soldiers, essentially unknowingly, to the Antarctic. And that's my personal opinion. Again, the timing of all these operations are not coincidental. If I'm a general and I see that people are focused on getting back to work in their home country and they're not paying attention to global news worldwide, this is the time to send 4,000 soldiers. Because in today's day and age, to send 4,000 soldiers anywhere from one place to another, regardless of what soldiers they belong or what country they belong to, is a big thing. So imagine 70, 80 years ago. That's a huge thing. And I think a lot of people underestimate that, by the way. Now, the thing that connects all of this is... An admiral by the name of Admiral Byrd, and I mentioned him a few minutes ago at the beginning of this episode, but the thing about Admiral Byrd is that he has written in his diary and in his journal that he encountered an entire separate world filled with uh, what he called very thick woolly mammoths and different types of creatures that seemed to be a sort of hybrid mix of different animals between different birds blending with that of horses and things like this now i know how ridiculous that sounds but again this was a highly respected a admiral who was a middle middle-aged gentleman didn't seem to have any mental problems and he writes this in his diary and this is only found after he dies so it's not like he claimed and he made a statement and he tried to go public with it to the extent of the research i've done he didn't try to go public with it at all he stayed quiet and then after he passed away, of course, as usual, people go through your belongings and they find that in his diary he had written that he had encountered a whole different civilization underneath Antarctica. Now, maybe he's trying to say in his diary that he was, he's trying to imply in a very subtle manner that he was intended and directed to go there and utilize Operation High Jump as a way to establish a sort of doorway into Agartha. We don't know. But to send three to 4,000 soldiers... I think is just is to do a little more than just training because normally when you want to train something or train soldiers in a new area, what I would imagine would happen is you would send a handful of maybe a, a two, three, four hundred soldiers, train them, see how it goes. And if it works well, then you bring in a bunch of other ones. But no, they went right into sending mass amounts of soldiers. And again, because we didn't have at the time the technology we do now that journalists have and people like you and I could get a hold of to track them and see what they're doing or at least try to then it really makes you think what were they doing there because ultimately admiral bird is the truthful and i guess you could say final confirmation of there being an existence of agartha now the thing is is that 
here's the thing. The paper in the document I showed you earlier about the Nazi map that supposedly shows Agartha, according to Gaia.com, and I quote, supposedly has been corroborated by a letter from a German U-boat navigator named Carl Unger, who claims U-209 made it to Agartha and that the Earth is in fact hollow. The letter also mentions the, notor the notorious German general Karl Hoschefer and Rudolf Hess, who he says were correct about the hollow Earth theory. Now, this is no joke. This is no small thing. These are big names that are corroborating this information. Why it hasn't been reported or hasn't been covered on a larger scale, I don't know. But again, this is one of the reasons why I do the show, because these little subtle facts are not reported and are honestly very little or are, are, are not well known. So, and that's another thing that's a little bit ironic. So the media, or at least within Western society, won't cover the corroboration from General Karl Hauschiffer and Rudolf Hess. But they have no problem taking German scientists, Nazi scientists, to come from Germany, wipe their records clean, and then work on building rockets to send Americans to the moon. And yet when the same people who were recruited for that, who survived because of that purpose, who the CIA helped clean and wipe their records, those same people have corroborated and claimed multiple times over and these are smart people, regardless of their past. I know it's a delicate thing to say, but those same people confirm that Agartha is real and that th that certain handful of Nazis had made it to Agartha, and then all of a sudden nobody listens to them. I think it's a little bit fishy. That's all I'm saying. The same people that were entrusted to build rockets to send the first man to the moon all of a sudden are not trusted when they say that what's underneath the earth is in fact true. It just makes you think. That's all I'm saying. So, again, what I'm going to do is, uh, if I haven't put a bunch of pictures up, I'm going to put all of the sources to the articles here of where I found all this. It took me a little bit of time to come together with all of it, but I hope that you guys can uh, can, can appreciate that and, and take a look at the sources for yourself and see what you think. And I, I want to make this very clear because I'm not trying to advocate for the hollow earth theory. I'm trying to allow you guys, the viewers and the listeners, to come up with your own conclusion and think of the idea that the entire Earth may not be hollow, certain aspects might be. The inner part of the Earth may be far more complex than we initially thought. It may not be as simple black and white, I, and which is why it kind of frustrates me to tell you the truth when I hear there being a debate about whether or not the Earth is hollow. Sometimes it's not black and white. Just like with many things in life, there's different responses, and it's very circumstantial. It depends where on earth are you talking about. Maybe a lot of it is rock and solid. Maybe some of it can inhabit life in certain parts of it. At this point in time, there's so many odd factoids that contribute to the, the concept of Agartha that we don't even know unless it has been corroborated or we have been given and shown legitimate full evidence so again let me know what you guys think i'm just trying to create a bit of a different perspective for you guys and we will catch you next time thank you